I'm Nima Rajan, and this is Forum Daily Week in Review. Quebec health officials are reporting 10 more cases of monkeypox, bringing the total confirmed cases in the province to 15. Last week, Quebec reported the first cases of the virus in Canada. The Public Health Agency of Canada said last week that it was already investigating about two dozen possible cases of monkeypox in the country. Meanwhile, Toronto Public Health says there are two new suspected cases of monkeypox in the city. There is also one probable case of the disease that's under investigation. The rare disease comes from the same family of viruses that causes smallpox. Well, joining us now to tell us a little bit more about monkeypox in our weekly medical segment is Dr. Abhishek Rout, Medical Director at Apple Tree Medical Group. Dr. Rout, welcome back to Forum Daily. Pleasure to be here. So what do we know so far about monkeypox and how it affects the body? Well, monkeypox is an extremely rare disease, uh, a less severe cousin of smallpox. Uh, we know that there have been about 250 cases in about 16 countries around the world. Uh, and we do know that it's spread by close and prolonged contact with an infected individual. So there's an incubation period of about 7 to 14 days. Uh, the symptoms are typically flu-like with fevers, chills, exhaustion, headache, and muscle weakness. And then we see this widespread rash that appears. There are painful raised pox. They're fluid-filled and surrounded by red circles. Then those lesions scab over and resolve over a period of two to three weeks. Uh, so what we are seeing here is something very similar to smallpox, but just less severe. Sounds like a condition no one wants, Dr. Rout. Now, uh, these cases seem to be increasing since first being reported in Canada just last week. So should Canadians be concerned about this? I think that's a very good point. Overall, what we're seeing is this is a disease that has been around for quite some time. Uh, we're talking about humans uh, since 1970. So when we look at Canada, you know, we, we would see the occasional outbreak here, but we do know that the risk of infection is relatively low. Uh, we'll probably hear more outbreaks coming in the next hours and days. But overall, what we're seeing is this type of smallpox is likely a 1% mortality rate, even in the most severe cases is there. And you, as you mentioned, uh, this does come from the same family of viruses that causes smallpox. Uh, how does monkeypox compare to smallpox? So now smallpox was really eradicated worldwide in 1980. It is also primarily spread by direct uh, contact, prolonged face-to-face -face contact with people, as well as objects contaminated by infected fluids like bedding or even clothing. Uh, so with smallpox patients come in contagious as soon as they develop sores and spread throughout, uh, they remained contagious until their lesions completely resolved there. Uh, based on the information we're seeing so far, monkeypox is far less contagious than that. So there's less concern on that. All right. Well, that's good to hear. But how can people stay safe from contracting monkeypox this summer? Uh, so that's a good question. I think the important thing here is, you know, close contact with an infected individual is required for that spread of monkeypox. Uh, so infection can really develop after exposure to broken skin, mucous membranes, respiratory droplets, infected body fluids, or even contact with any sort of linen. Uh, so when the lesions have healed, the scabs themselves may also shed which could technically be inhaled. So there are a couple of ways that we can see that transmission occur. So our public health is really advising similar things that we've heard before, physical distancing, frequent hand washing and masking, and all of these measures that we're really using to fight the COVID-19 pandemic. And what steps should people take if they are infected with monkeypox, Dr. Rout? What we know is isolation and quarantine work really well to limit the spread of monkeypox. Uh, the only issue is, you know, we're seeing the symptoms prolonged for extended uh, weeks. So unlike COVID-19, where we would recommend isolation for a shorter duration, for monkeypox, we would recommend the isolation be about three weeks. Uh, and that way we decrease the potential to be in contact with someone else who could get that. All right, Dr. Rao, just about a minute left here, but what does the discovery of monkeypox mean for the COVID-19 pandemic? I think that's a good question, and I'm, I'm sure we are hoping for no more pandemics in the future, but monkeypox uh, with the world, uh, I would say the world is facing a very different situation compared to the early days of COVID-19. Monkeypox is in many ways a known quantity. We have tools to prevent it as well, uh, and we certainly know far more about it than we did when COVID-19 first struck. 
Uh, but both public health and general public have had a lot of practice taking in these measures, preventing infections in general from spreading. Uh, so, so I remain quite uh, cautiously optimistic that despite any trajectory or increase, uh, we're going to stay vigilant and stay on top of this. I'm sure that's good to hear for our viewers. Dr. Abhishek Rout, Medical Director at Apple Tree Medical Group, thank you again for your time today. Thanks so much. Stocks rose broadly in morning trading on Wall Street Thursday as investors cheered a strong set of quarterly results from Macy's and other retailers. The S&P 500 rose 1.3 percent and is solid, solidly in the green for the week following a choppy few days of trading. The gains have positioned the benchmark index for its first weekly gain after seven straight losses. The Dow Jones Industrial Average rose 1.3 percent and the Nasdaq rose 1.5 percent. The better-than-expected reports from retailers helped allay investors' worries about the sector, which took big losses last week after Target and Walmart reported dismal results. Meanwhile, as investors come off the high of the bull market last year, concerns are rising around quelling your emotions during a bear market. Well, joining us now to help us unpack this is Mr. Thomas Caldwell, chair of Caldwell Securities Limited. Sir, welcome back to Forum Daily. Thank you, Nina. Now, we know many investors actually borrowed to invest during the bull market last year, and a lot of them had not really experienced a bear market. So what should investors do now? <laughs> well, you can't give a blanket piece of advice. Let me tell you one thing. One of the smarter things I did when I started our firm well over 40 years ago was no margin accounts. We felt investors should not borrow money to buy securities. It's one thing to be down 10 or 20 percent in a market. It's a completely different thing to be wiped out. And that's what happens when you use leverage, that is, you borrow money to buy securities. I think people were uh, kind of lulled into the fact the market was continually moving up. And if they didn't have any money, they could borrow money and invest. And they were encouraged to do that. Uh, that's all right, but you have to consider risk. The point now is the market has pulled back. And if you were margined, and many people have been forced to sell securities to pay off that margin debt or to reduce it. Uh, I think at the present time, the market seems to want to stabilize a little bit here, but I, there's an old phrase, a cliche in our business, liquidate to the sleeping point. And, uh, you know, if you're upset and you're uptight about it and you've got money borrowed, get it down as best you can and live to fight another day. Don't worry about the grand slam at this point in time. Just get yourself in a position that you can hang in and make money as markets go forward. Uh, you just don't want to get uh, forced to sell out because of margin debt. Meanwhile, on the other hand, after two years of pandemic stress, we know Canadians are actually expected to spend more this summer. But what is the importance of saving and investing in your future, especially at this time, Mr. Caldwell? Well, you know, there's two ways you learn something. You can learn by listening to good advice or you can learn through experience. One is easy, the other one is hard. And I think a lot of people have gone through very difficult times in this last little while so my, my, my sense is that people are going to be a little bit more conservative on a go forward basis, a little bit more careful about their spending, uh, a little bit wiser when it comes to just keeping a little money aside because what we've seen happen was a shock to everybody. So I think that's really a good lesson for people. So, you know, just use your brain. I, you know, that's the easiest thing. Just make sure you've got some money aside when things are difficult because difficulty always comes, whether it be in a macro sense, like an economy or, or markets or personal something, you're always surprised by something. So it, it never hurts. I make better decisions when I have a little money in the bank and I can think calmer. And I think that's a good thing. All right, sir. Well, uh, inflation continues to dog investors and consumers, but it seems to be embedded in our lives for quite some time. So what are the best ways to cope with this new normal? Well, you know, it's funny. I, I uh, I was listening to a University of Alberta professor talking about increases in gas prices. And they were saying, what should people do? And he said, oh, drive less and buy a smaller car. And I thought, wait a sec, this guy's a professor. If you're worried about gasoline prices being too high, buy some of the energy companies. We made a great deal of money for our clients by buying the energy companies when they were all down, when everybody's selling them. And, and uh, so the fact that gasoline prices has gone up, we've made a lot more than that for our clients by the ownership of assets that are providing the gasoline and doing the refinery. So I still think inflation, the way you hedge against inflation is to own stuff. And by the way, stocks are considered stuff. That's 
you're owning companies that can generate income. So whether you own real estate or something that's gonna go up in value, uh, but I think equities are a very good way to deal with inflation. Uh, as far as the rest goes, individuals adjust their affairs according to their income. Eh? You don't buy steak, you buy hamburger. So that's part of what you're doing. People are smart enough to adjust their spending habits as they need to. And uh, But if you wanna hedge against it, then you have to own stuff. And I think basically equities are a very good hedge against inflation. Always great advice, sir. Thank you again for joining us today on Forum Daily. Thank you, Nima. After the break, we'll be taking a look at the UN Human Rights Chief's visit to China and what she hopes this trip will accomplish. We'll have an interview with Dr. Charles Burton, an expert on China and senior fellow at the McDonald Laurier Institute up next. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Chinese leader Xi Jinping has defended China's record to the top UN human rights official. This while criticizing those countries that he said lecture others on human rights and politicize the issue. He told visiting UN human rights chief Michel Bachelet that China has embarked on a path of human rights development and suits its own national conditions. The two spoke on video phone. Ms. Bachelet is on a six-day visit to China that includes Xinjiang, a region where Chinese governments have been accused of human rights violations. Her trip has been criticized by the U.S. and others who think that China will use it for propaganda purposes. With us now to discuss the visit is Dr. Charles Burton, an expert on China and senior fellow at the McDonald Laurier Institute. Sir, welcome back to Forum Daily. It's good to speak with you again. So what is the UN Human Rights Chief looking to accomplish with this trip to China? Well, certainly the UN Human Rights Chief has been under a lot of pressure to try to come to terms with the very serious allegations of genocide committed by the government of China against the Uyghur ethnic minority. And so, you know, she's been negotiating uh, to visit China for quite some time. It seems that uh, she will be able to travel to China, but uh, the, the, the issue really is, will she see anything of the evidence of genocide or will her trip be so carefully vetted that she will only see um, you know, facilities which are not reflective of the reality on the ground? And certainly the Chinese government has already said that because of the COVID-19 pandemic, she will be kept in what they refer to as a bubble, which means that there will be no foreign journalists accompanying her and she will likely have no spontaneous contact with anybody in China while she's there. And we know China's president is saying that other countries are politicizing human rights issues. So uh, what does China's president mean by that? Well, you know, China rejects the idea of universal values and clearly doesn't want to be compliant with the international norms of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that provide Chinese, that should be extending to Chinese citizens entitlements to freedom of expression and freedom of choice of their political leaders and independent judiciary under the Chinese Communist Party's uh, rule. None of these are allowed for for Chinese people. So China is very sensitive on the issue of human rights because they're not prepared to extend any human rights to their population. And so this becomes uh, an issue in, in our relations because we expect that human rights is a universal norm that should be universally respected regardless of where the humans are, that they should all be given the entitlements of citizenship. So it, 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 you know, China on the one hand claims that they maintain human rights in a Chinese way, but on the other hand, there's nothing about the Chinese Communist Party's rule which is any way consistent with human rights doctrine as we understand it. And, stay, and staying on the topic of human rights, we know this trip would include a visit to the Xinjiang region. Uh, so tell our viewers, we just have about two minutes, so really briefly, can you tell us about the situation there with the Uyghur minorities? Well, the Uyghurs are... Uh, about 11 million people living in the northwestern part of the People's Republic of China, 
who speak a language that is similar to Turkish, and they, they you know, they they look uh, like like Turkish people. They don't look like Chinese at all. The Chinese government wants to assimilate them to Han Chinese norms, to learn Mandarin Chinese, and support China's rise to power led by the Han minority. Many Uyghurs would prefer to be ruled by their own people in their own area, which they refer to as East Turkestan. And the Chinese government is therefore trying to eliminate the Uyghur culture and language and religious practice to try and suppress this uh, separatist tendency and dissatisfaction of the Uyghurs with Chinese rule from Beijing. All right. Well, uh, Dr. Burton, a bit, uh, just about 30 seconds left here, but what do you expect from this trip? Well, I'm not optimistic that uh, that the UN chief will come back with any kind of meaningful report on the situation of the Uyghurs, but uh, let's see what she says when she uh, returns to uh, to the UN and, and hopefully will make some progress in understanding exactly what China's doing in those regions. And it's pretty clear that it, it amounts to genocide under the UN Genocide Convention. We'll definitely have to keep our eyes out for that. Dr. Burton, thank you again for joining us today on Forum Daily. Very good to speak with you. Up next, we have an important conversation about SIDS, better known as Sudden Infant Death Syndrome. We'll be speaking with Dr. Wendy Potter, Chair of the Board of Directors at Baby's Breath Canada, to examine a new study out of Australia on the discovery of a potential biomarker for SIDS and to discuss what all parents should know about this tragic condition. New research out of Australia may help identify an indicator for sudden infant death syndrome, commonly known as SIDS. The recent study from the Children's Hospital at Westmead in Australia has discovered a potential biomarker for SIDS. While it has been touted as a medical breakthrough since its publication, this study only represents an incremental advance towards finding a possible cause for this condition. Baby's Breath Canada, a national organization focused on SIDS, estimates that three infants die of SIDS every single week in Canada. In addition, infants of an indigenous background are at even greater risk of SIDS. Well, joining us today to discuss this condition is Dr. Wendy Potter, chair of the board at Baby's Breath Canada. Doctor, welcome to Forum Daily. My pleasure. It's awesome to be able to talk about this with you and to get some of the messaging out. We appreciate you joining us, ma'am. Now, can you explain to our viewers about this potential biomarker for SIDS that was discovered in this study? Yes. So first, I guess a little uh, background. Biomarkers are naturally occurring genes or characters or substances that are associated with certain functions or conditions, and they're measurable. And esterase is a protein or an enzyme that works uh, and is involved in the autonomic nervous system. This is a system that helps regulate different things in your body, like your heart rate and your breathing, when you are completely unaware that it's uh, working sort of in the background, I guess. And the researchers in this study uh, feel that uh, but butyrylcholinesterase might be uh, a biomarker to help identify babies who may have an increased risk of dying of sudden infant death syndrome that a deficit of this enzyme uh, would alter uh, the autonomic nervous system and its ability to um, um, influence the way babies are breathing and perhaps the baby wouldn't uh, arouse uh, as it normally would. Now, this is being touted as a huge development in this research, but what does this mean for potential treatments or screenings for, for the future of SIDS? This study is a very interesting and solid contribution to SIDS research. It's, however, small, uh, very preliminary, and definitely further research needs to um, be encouraged so that we can understand the significance. Um, at this point, SIDS is considered an umbrella diagnosis, and uh, it, it is not considered to be uh, one cause uh, fits all. However, importantly, uh, this study brings again up um, important questions of arousal issues and also the work other researchers are doing on bi uh, biomarkers, different biomarkers. Uh, serotonin is one of those. And people have been working on these things for uh, decades, actually. Um, progress seems to be slow. 
Um, but uh, still some work has to be done before we can understand how specifically it can identify uh, risk. Um, we use screening tests to identify issues or abnormalities, but they're only good if we are able then to intervene and change and make improvements such that, um, you know, the life of a baby would be improved. Um, we are far from this uh, with the new and exciting research. Um, and the other um, issue is you don't want to alarm parents. There are errors that can occur, inaccuracies. And so, although I wouldn't call it uh, a breakthrough, it's definitely a, a very welcome contribution and enormous interest has been generated, which is, is just fantastic. Just about a minute left here, Dr. Potter, but uh, what information should every parent know when it comes to SIDS? Uh, probably the most important thing, SIDS is probably um, multifactorial. You cannot predict it, you can't prevent it, and it is not the same as uh, suffocation or accidental asphyxia. You can reduce the risk by following safe sleep guidelines, and that you can find those on uh, the Joint Statement of Public Health of Canada, PHAC, and you can find that in multiple videos on our website, uh, Baby Spread. It is probably related to a genetic or biological vulnerability, and research in that area really should be encouraged. Dr. Wendy Potter from Baby's Breath Canada, thank you again for your time today and sharing this with us. Thank you so much. All right, I'm Nima Rajan, and that'll do it for your look at important conversations from this past week. Remember, for more news on demand, you can always visit our website, thenewsforum.ca, and make sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for updates. Thanks again for joining us on the Forum Daily Week in Review, and we'll see you again next time. Have a great weekend, Canada. Take care.